You know, people really do believe in the return of Jesus more than they believe in the gospel. We'll all sign up and say, you know, Jesus is coming back. Oh, look at what's going on. That's a sign. Jesus is coming back. Hallelujah. Jesus is going to be here. What about the gospel that was given to us that gives us all authority to trample over demons? How many of us are calling out on the gospel and knowing what it says and believing what it says and walking in the full authority of that? I know it, it's work. I know it takes time for us to believe and for us to continue to walk in, in faith. You know, spiritual things are not natural. Spiritual things are spiritual things. But once you get it, you got it, and nobody can take it away from you. And we have to be reconciled to that point, to that place where we walk out what God would have us to walk out to be ultimately effective for Him. So we have been going through a series now called Kingdom Finances. Has anybody found that to be a blessing? Yes. Oh, okay, three of us, awesome. <laughs> Awesome. Yeah, Kingdom Finances. And you know, I'm just so grateful because whenever we go through the Word of God, it continues to change me, change my heart, change my life, changes my perspective. And so we're going to talk a little bit more about the Kingdom Finances. And really, we're going to talk about prosperity and what that really means. Because pros being prosperous isn't just with money. Oh, let me stand over here. <laughs> being prosperous isn't just about money. Being prosperous is having a whole life designed about the glory that God wants to give, do, and have with us, representing him here on the earth. So we're going to talk a little bit about that. But some things that we want to review that our pastor has been so diligent just to continue to remind us is that when we started talking about kingdom finances, we asked the question, he asked the question over and over again, if you had more money, would you do more for the kingdom? Yes, you would. I would do the same. The more money I have, the more options I have. The more I can do things differently, the more I can finance different ministries. I can finance what God, the Holy Spirit, is ministering to me as to what I can do for the kingdom. Yes is the answer. If I had more, I would do more. He also talked about finances and us putting ourselves in a position to be a vessel to be used by God is more than a financial position. It's a spiritual position. Prosperity really allows us to live the life that God called us to live. And how many of you know it wasn't just a life that he decided yesterday or when we became a believer to believe? Prosperity in the life of a giver is something that God designed for us to do. The principle of sowing and reaping continues to reap throughout everything that we do, even if you don't realize that you're sowing that. If you're mean to people and people are mean to you, you sow that. If you're full of joy and happiness and you sow that with people, what you receive in the joy and happiness is what you sow. So it's a common principle that we do all the time. A lot of you, like me, get up in the morning and you go to a job and you work. And time well spent at that job allows you to be compensated with a check. It's sowing and reaping all the way around us. But if we know who we are and the position that Jesus set, it up, set us up in, it's far above than we can even think or imagine. And we need to rehearse that position over and over again. We need to understand and know where we are so God can use us effectively. It is one of the most powerful positions that you can be in. Because when you identify who you are and whose you are, that's when God can really tap into what it is that you have to give him including your finances. Amen? Amen? Awesome. So we're going to be going over some word today, and this word, uh, I intend for it to be words that lift off of the pages and into your spirits. So we have notes. We give notes here. There are notes available for you online. And we have you look at these scriptures for the number one reason of having them placed in your heart, that you can pull up these scriptures when things are going on. Pull them up and believe that if God said it, it's true. So turn with me to Psalm 35 and verse 27. Now, I like the message translation in a lot, and we'll be using the message, and we'll use the passion translation in a lot of the different scriptures that I talk about today. You can use whatever version you want. It's whatever that you understand. 
where you get the understanding so that you really just don't read the scripture, but you know the scripture. And if you understand what it says, you can apply it in your life. Amen? Awesome. Don't let that pass you. Grab that. So in Psalm 35, verse 27, it says, But those who want the best for me, let them have the last word, a glad shout, and say over and over and over, God is great. Everything works together for good for his servant. I'll tell the world how great and good you are. I'll shout hallelujah all day, every day. And I can't resist. I have to go to the Passion Translation because I really like that one too. And that says the same verse, Psalm 30, um, excuse me, yeah, Psalm 35, verse 27. And that says, But let all my true friends shout for joy, all those who know and love what I do for you. Let them all say, The Lord is great, and he delights in the prosperity of his servant. So we have it there written in scripture that God delights in the prosperity of his servant. So anytime you hear anybody saying that it's wrong to have money, any, anytime you hear somebody saying, well, you know, those people are just so in love with money that it's not a good thing, remember God says that he delights in the prosperity of his servant. That's what the word of God says, and that's what we believe. So let's turn to some more scripture. Let's go to John chapter 14, starting in verse 10. John 14, 10. Where are you guys going? John okay, then let's go together. That's awesome. And that says, don't you believe that the Father is living in me and that I am living in the Father? Even my words are not my own, but come from my Father. For he lives in me and performs his miracles of power through me. Believe that I live as one with my Father, and that my Father lives as one with me. Or at least believe because of the mighty miracles I have done. I tell you this timeless truth. The person who follows me in faith, believing in me, will do the same mighty miracles that I do even greater miracles than these because I go to be with the Father. So let's just pause there for a second and understand what's being said there. So in this verse, it talks, Jesus is talking, and he's talking about his Father and him being in his Father, and his Father is in him. What we got to understand and remember is, is that when we make the exchange in our relationship to have a relationship with Jesus, we are making an exchange from where we are to what it is that God really created and intended us to have or to be. When you become a believer, you exchange your ways, your thoughts, your will, and you submit yourselves to understanding that you not only want to be saved to be able to go to heaven, but you want Jesus to be the Lord of your life where you're going to him for instruction as to what to do next. We complicate it so very much because we think that in a lot of religious settings that I have to do A, B, and C to qualify in order to be the right type of Christian. But more importantly, what you need to understand is, is that exchange happens and it's a complete exchange. You don't have to be any more filled with the Spirit. You don't have to be any more saved. You don't have to be any more. When you make that exchange, that exchange is done. And there's so many benefits that come along with that exchange. One of the benefits is understanding is Jesus was in the Father, he's also in me. So as Jesus did here on the earth, so will I, and greater things I'm called to do than he did. So if we understand and if we establish that, we understand and know that if I'm in Jesus and Jesus is in me, there's really nothing else that I need. But what I do have to do is get in that sweet spot that we were just in in worship and live out that life. I can't be distracted by everything that's going on. I can't allow the experiences that I've gone through to teach me what it is I'm supposed to live now. I can't allow what my goals, my ambition, my thoughts override who I am and become what they say I am rather than what God created me to be. 
So we have to continue to reconcile over and over again to come back where we start. Many of you play the game. Does anybody here, have you ever played Monopoly? You play Monopoly, right? So then you go around, and every time you go around, you collect $200 when you start at the beginning again, right? Well, we have to go back and collect our $200 because nothing changes when you go around again and you start that game, you get your $200 because you qualify for that $200. So everything that happens in the kingdom of God, you qualify when you made that exchange to take over, let Jesus take over your life and be the Lord of your life, not just your Savior. And there are a lot of believers that are walking around that are just happy that they check the box that they're going to go to heaven. And there's nothing wrong with going to heaven. I'm going to be there one day. Nothing wrong with it. But you can actually have heaven here on earth. You don't have to live with the distractions and the struggle that a lot of people choose to live with as a believer. Now, those that are not believers, they're in a different position because they haven't made that exchange that we made. Those that are walking around dealing with life as life is on life terms don't have the insight and the revelation that we have. And that's one of the reasons why we need to live in prosperity in order to be able to show them what the glory of God looks like. So again, finances is not a bad thing. Prosperity is not a bad thing. And we have to continue to reconcile what that relationship is in order to live out the abundance that God has called us to. So let's talk about that a little bit. Let's go to Ephesians chapter 2 and verse number 1. Where are you guys going? What's so amazing about the word of God is, is that it never changes. So if it's Ephesians chapter 2 verse 1 today, it's going to be Ephesians chapter 2 verse 1 tomorrow. And what we have to get good at is rehearsing the word of God in order for it not just to be a verse in the Bible, but to be a mantra out of our spirit that's written in our heart that we live off of. So let's take a look at what that says. I am looking in the Passion Translation first. And it says, And his fullness fills you, even though you were once like corpses, dead in your sins and offenses. It wasn't that long ago that you lived in religion, customs, and values of this world, obeying the dark rule of the earthly realm who fills the atmosphere with his authority and works diligently in the heart of those who are disobedient to the truth of God. Let's just hold on to that. Disobedient to the truth of God. The corruption that was in us from birth was expressed through the deeds and desires of our self-life. We live by whatever natural cravings and thoughts our mind dictated, living as rebellious children subject to God's wrath like everyone else. But God still loved us with such a great love. He is so rich in compassion and mercy. Even when we were dead and doomed in in our many sins, he united us into the very life of Christ and saved us by his wonderful grace. He raised us up with Christ, the exalted one, and we ascended with him into the glorious perfection authority of the heavenly realm. For we are now co-seated as one with Christ. We're co-seated as one with Christ. Now, am I telling you that you are Jesus? Absolutely not. But I am telling you that you are seated in heavenly places where Jesus is seated. And when you really understand that, when you really start walking in the authority that Jesus gave you, that God gave you, that the Holy Spirit reminds you of, you walk in a whole different level of what's available for you, especially regarding your finances. You're not concerned about all of the little bills that are coming your way, which is a natural part of this life. You are walking in a level of understanding that because I'm seated in heavenly places where Jesus is, I'm going to be able to not only overcome that, but to allow that to be a lower priority because God's got me. And as I continue to walk that out, knowing that God's got me, I continue to rehearse and reconcile my place in what Jesus did for me. 
Oh, you gotta get this, you guys. We gotta know who we are. We gotta know what Jesus did for us. We have to reconcile that so we know that when we're looking at something, we're not looking down at something, saying that we are better than. We are looking to something to say we have the authority because of what Jesus did. And so there's a humbleness that comes about you. There's a power that comes about you because those things that are coming your way, that are coming against you, have no power. They have no authority because of what Jesus did and who Jesus is. So let's take, I'm gonna be up here all by myself, it's okay. Let's take a little bit of look exactly to see what Jesus actually did. So when you hear the ascended in there, ascended means risen to heaven. Now, I don't know anybody here that doesn't believe or know that heaven is a high place. Do we all know that heaven's a high place? So if you're ascending to heaven, that means you're going in a higher place, higher place of understanding, higher place of authority, higher place of purpose. And when you're at that higher place, you're not at a higher place to say that you're better than someone else. You're at a higher place to be more effective with what God would have done in this earth in his kingdom. You see, God needs us. You know, what's so amazing about God and when we do get to heaven is that there's no time. There's just now. We read in scripture how it says God is a God of now. Well, he is a God of now. He knows the beginning to the end. He knows all the little details that are going to happen in our life. He knows everything. So there's no mystery to God. But what we get to do is we get to take a look at the time that we have to get it right. Time is not for God. Time is for us to continue to get it right. He gives us opportunity and opportunity to continue to choose him. Because remember, we're free will agents. But the time that we get, the now time, the time that we get to continue to sow and to reap the things of God for God is all that we're looking for in this experience. Now, when we made that decision, we made that exchange that we now allow Jesus to take over and he becomes the Lord of our life, what we really need to understand is, is that our eternity begins at that moment. Our eternity begins. There are so many people that are wrapped up in, I will wait until I get over into heaven to have all the good. There's so many people that are misunderstanding the authority that they actually walk in right now. They are looking towards the eternity or dreading the death or transition here on this earth to wait to get to the promised land to receive all of what God has for us. Now, absolutely, there is glory that's available to us. We really can't even comprehend in our little minds what that really means to be, to be transitioned into feeling love everywhere and to having things talk to you and that you, you operate based on the speed of thought. I mean, we really can't comprehend that in our little minds because we're so in the natural world. But we don't have to wait to be in that eternity for us to live out eternity here. There is a scripture that tells us, and you know what, let's just go to it. I was trying not to, but let's go. Go to Matthew chapter 16 and verse 19. You can go whatever translation y'all want to go to, okay? Matthew chapter 16 and verse 19 says, Matthew 16, 19. There we go. It says, I will give you the keys of heaven's kingdom, heaven's kingdom realm to forbid on earth that which is forbidden in heaven and to release on earth that which is released. So by this scripture, this allows us to know what we do here on earth means something in heaven. What we bind here on earth, what we take authority over, what we don't allow to happen here is also done in heaven. And what we lose here on earth, the power, the love, the glory, the majesty, when we lose that here on earth, it is available for us in heaven. But we don't have to wait to get to heaven to operate in that realm. It says here in the word that we can have it here right now. We can have heaven here on earth. We can operate in an ascendant place where Jesus is that he allows us to be seated with him. 
And we can operate from that level with everything that we do, every decision that we make, everything that we do as far as the principles of the things of God, with healing, with faith, we can operate from that level. And I tell you, God is looking for us to operate from that level because he needs to finance his kingdom. He doesn't need to finance his kingdom with people that have in their will, well, I'll give the church this amount of money when I die. He needs to finance the kingdom with people that are willing to do what he would have them to do as they work in the kingdom and be that example for others. We don't have to wait. We get it twisted sometimes to think that, you know, heaven is over here when we're going to get there. One day we're going to make it. We're going to transition. We already know we're going to make it because we made that exchange. But what heaven are you living here on earth? What are you doing? Is your mind so cluttered with the material things and how you can get and, and accomplish those things that you're taking away from the kingdom of God and what God wants to use you to do with those things that you acquire? Are you so fixated and impulsated with all of the bills that you have to pay that becomes a distraction from you enter, enter, entering a relationship with your family to be the, give them the best part of your day with the love and kindness you have because you're so stressed out because SRP is coming at you. We have the ability, because God created us to have the ability to choose. And that free will becomes such a choice. It's such a glorious choice when we choose him. But we got to know our position and reconcile that over and over again. Listen, I'm not telling you something that I got mastery of. I'm telling you something that I continue to educate myself about and continue to line up. I mean, repent wasn't just for that one time. Oh, maybe y'all, maybe y'all, maybe they didn't know. Repent isn't just for the one time that you repent to go to God. You need to repent often of your wrong thinking, your wrong ways, how you misplace your priorities. You need to repent and turn back to God as far as the reconciliation that he gave us with Jesus. Speaking to all of us here, it is not a game, but it is the best answer in anything that you have to bring it back, to go back to what Jesus has done for us. So let's take another little look. So in order for us to understand who Jesus is, let's walk out a couple of things. Because, you know, for we say Jesus died on the cross and he, he came back to life and that's all good. And I'm definitely not dismissing that or, and all that. But th there's a little bit more that I want you to really uh, encapsulate in our mind to take a hold of. Jesus is God. Now, we here in Word Life, we believe in the Trinity. We believe in Father God. We believe in His Son, Jesus, and we believe in the Holy Spirit. So let me just clarify that for anybody, anybody watching, misunderstanding, all that. We believe in the Trinity. But we also believe in the power and the position of who Jesus is. Jesus is God. He was God in male form, and He came to earth as a man in order for us to be reconciled to God because we were falling in a state of sin because of that guy named Adam. Yeah. And so because of what Adam did, Jesus was able to die on the cross for us, for our sins, not just for the sins that we know we committed, but the sins that we didn't even know that we were going to commit when we weren't even born here on earth. Jesus took care of it, okay? <laughs> Jesus is God. Amen. And my proof text for that is John 8, 57 through 59. He is the son of God. He was created in God's image. He took on God's authority and represents him here on the earth. And so the reason why it's so important for us to understand that is because we need to know why we honor Jesus. We need to know who Jesus was. Because once you know who Jesus is, you put him in the rightful place in your life. He's not just a man that died on the cross and he... He allowed us to be able to enter into the kingdom of heaven and have a relationship with God. He is all power and all authority. He is the Son of God. And Jesus is the Word of God. He is God revealed to us in the Word, in the Scriptures. The Word became flesh and made His dwelling among us. And I have the proof text for that, John chapter 1, verses 1 and 2. John chapter 1, verse 14. Jesus is the word of God. When we read the word, it talks about him coming. 
It talks about him dwelling amongst us and that the power that came about as we read the scriptures and know this is God being revealed to us. So Jesus is God. Jesus is the son of God. Jesus is the word of God. And Jesus is the king forever. He is the radiance of God's glory and the representation of his being. He sustains all things by his powerful word. And the proof text for that is in Hebrews chapter 1, verses 1 through 3. So when you understand, and I submit to you, don't just listen to the words that I'm saying. Go through these verses. Go through the chapters. Get an understanding of knowing who Jesus is, and it will blow your mind. Because when we understand who Jesus is, when we understand and know what Jesus has done for us, when we understand and know the power and the authority that we actually walk in, there is no devil in hell that will be able to come against who you are in him. Amen. And so then finances becomes a symbol. It becomes the sowing and reaping that allows us to be able to not only inherit the blessing of being diligent over monies, it allows us to move all of those concerns out of the way to be effective in the kingdom of God. So many of us say that if we had more, we'd do more. But how many of us are living like if we had more, we'd do more? How many of us are taking a look and knowing that the seed that you sown is a seed that belongs to God? How many of us know the offerings that we give are just a testimony of worshiping and praising God because you're using a monetary thing that's necessary in this life to give to somebody else to enhance where they are and that they'll be able to see and know that that money changes a situation? How many of us are, are signing ourselves up to be that? Or are we so close-minded and focused on us that we're not taking the time to be able to see the ascended position that we stand in? We have got to get it together. And so this message today is not just a call of us understanding what we can do with our finances. It's a call in understanding the position that you stand in in order to be more effective with how God be able to use you. And finances is a part of that. You know, it's so funny when people are in different situations and you know the the number one thing that they do if there is a financial need they'll you know pray and ask God to cover them and to make sure that they get the money and God is so sovereign and loves us so much we talked about that great love that he has for us that he'll hear the petition and he'll answer the petition and use other people to allow you to be able to see his grace and his mercy but how many of us are only doing that when it comes to something that we need how many of us need to be in a position to say, God, yes, you can use me. Oh, wait, they need that over there at the church? Oh, uh, oh, well, we can do that. I can do that. I can take money so that I have because everything is taken care of because I believe you. And I'm walking in my position of being an heir with Jesus. I'm walking in my ascended position. Everything is going to be taken care of. Well, let me use this money for what you'd have me to use it for because the finances are no longer a distraction. They're already taken care of. Or even when they are a distraction, to allow that distraction not to speak to you louder than what God says for you to do it. We've got to get ourselves in that position because the kingdom of God is counting on us. It's absolutely counting on us. You know, people really do believe in the return of Jesus more than they believe in the gospel. We'll all sign up and say, you know, Jesus is coming back. Oh, look at what's going on. That's a sign. Jesus is coming back. Hallelujah. Jesus is going to be here. What about the gospel that was given to us that gives us all authority to trample over demons? How many of us are calling out on the gospel and knowing what it says and believing what it says and walking in the full authority of that? I know it, it's work. I know it takes time for us to believe and for us to continue to walk in, in faith. You know, spiritual things are not natural. Spiritual things are spiritual things. But once you get it, you got it. And nobody can take it away from you. And we have to be reconciled to that point, to that place where we walk out what God would have us to walk out to be ultimately effective for him. 
Thanks for joining us today. We hope that you picked up what God had in store for you. And if not, feel free to rewatch and definitely subscribe to our YouTube channel and be on the lookout for future content. We are so excited to see what God has in store for you. And we'll see you next time.